Okay, now we're good to go. All right, now we're recording and we are good to go for day three of Quantum Leap, um, where we're going to be talking about maximizing your potential. We're going to be creating a um, we're going to be creating a plan to uh, a personal mission statement. We're going to be setting big goals that require a big plan, such that uh, the plan pre pretty much guarantees you hit your original goal. And then um, creating a plan to actually achieve those big goals. All right. So that is kind of the goal for today. Uh, but we're going to start by talking about some of the lies that lie between you and success. All right. Um, it's, it's something that Gary likes to do in his book because a lot of people have this, these mindsets. Right. I know not any of us. Right. Because we talked about limiting beliefs yesterday. Um, but a lot of people have the, these these mindsets, these things that they believe that actually get in the way of them achieving the things that they're looking to achieve. So we're gonna start with some of those. So the first, the first thing is, do you know what your potential truly is, right? One of the big differences between people who are wildly successful and people who aren't is that people who are wildly, wildly successful believe in themselves in the first place. They believe that they were put on this earth for a greater purpose. They believe um, that their goals are possible to achieve. They're not afraid to fail. And they, and they work from a clear sense of priority. Now, I know he's a pretty, uh, he can be a bit of a, um, a polarizing figure in our world, but um, I like to use him as an example. Do you, do you feel that Elon Musk, right? Yeah, I like using Elon Musk as an example, right? Do you feel like he's somebody that's driven by a big purpose, right? He believes his purpose, the reason he's on this earth, is to save humanity. He believes that the world is going to end and that the only way humans will survive is if we figure out how to get off the planet. And so his purpose is to save humanity and, to, and, and, and his goal in order to do that is to be able to colonize Mars. It's a crazy big dream, right? But do you think that purpose drives him, right? And think about what he's accomplished on his path to fulfilling those, that purpose, right? He's created the largest electric vehicle company in the world. It is the, it, even though they don't, even though they sell few, way fewer cars than any of the other big players, they're worth more than the entire car industry combined. His, right? Tesla is now a $1 trillion company, which is more than all the other automakers combined. But his goal had nothing to do with building the largest electric, like the largest car company, right? It was, it's about saving humanity. That's why he started doing it. Um, so successful people are driven by a larger, a bigger purpose and they, but they believe, they believe in themselves and they believe in their ability to achieve those goals. Second, uh, number one lie, and we've talked about this, so we're not going to spend too much time on it today, right? Is that everything matter, matters equally, right? We talked about this yesterday and we talked about it the day before. There's a reason why we talk about it a lot is because it is one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves in one of the biggest areas where uh, one of the biggest um, roadblocks to our success is focusing on everything because it all matters equally, right? High achievers learn to focus on what matters most. All right, second lie is that multitasking works. How many people here feel like multitasking, they're a really good multitasker? You guys are like, well, you just told me that multitasking doesn't work, so I'm not going to raise my hand, right? How many people think that they're a really good multitasker? How many people believe that there are multitaskers out there that are just like superhuman? They can, con like they get so many different things done and they, and, and you never know. And, and you're like, how do they do it all? Right? How many people know somebody like that? All right, 
So we're going to do a little exercise here just to prove my point. I want you to pull out a piece of paper. Everybody take a piece of paper. And I want you to write the numbers 1 to 26. And then I want you to write the alphabet, alphabet from A to Z. All right. Give me one second. And we're going to start in five, 3, 2, 1, and go. As soon as you're done, put done in the chat or raise your hand on the video so I can see you. All right, we had our first person, second person. Got a couple people still writing. I can see them writing at least in their thing, right? Okay, uh, anybody still going? All right. So the shortest, the, the, the fastest person in the room did that in about 26 seconds. The slowest was about, was about, let me do the math here, was a, um, was like 52 seconds. All right. So fastest, I'm just making some notes, was 26, slowest was 52. All right, I want you to, now we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it, an, an, all right, everybody lower their hand, or I, I'll lower your hand for you, how's that? Um, All right, we're gonna do it again. <laughs> Silva, that's funny. <laughs> All right, no, you gotta move fast, okay? All right, so here's what I want you to do now. I want you to flip the piece of paper over or get a new piece of paper if you, if you, if you have one, right? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to write the number one and then the letter A, and then the number two and the letter B. And then don't start yet. I see you, April Fury. Don't you start yet. All right. When I say go, you're going to start and you're going to go one A, two B, three C, right? Just like that. All right. All the way till the end. And three, two, one, go. All right, we still got some people writing. Is everybody done? Okay. Um, all right, you, you ready for this? The fastest time we had took 35 seconds. The slowest, the slowest time we had was 64. The slowest time was 10% slower. The fastest time was more than 10% slower. The fastest time was almost 40% slower. Silva said this was easier. For some people, it is easier because it's the second time doing it. But we also didn't compare like individual performance. Like I know I did faster. Of course. And, 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 and Dana, I'm sure like, so here's the thing. Everybody's going to respond a little bit differently. That's why I just went with fastest and slowest, right? I don't know if you particularly were faster the second time around or not, but I know generally as a group, we were at best 10% slower. I mean, at worst, 10% slower and at best, 
40% slower or 35% slower, right? So, so let me ask, did, would you say that going back and forth was, was, was better or, or worse? I say it was worse. My handwriting was a lot worse as well when I was trying to go back and forth between writing the numbers and the letters. Like not only was I slower, but my handwriting was also a lot worse. Okay. Who else? Yeah, so uh, when, I, when I was writing 23, instead of writing the number 23, I wrote a W in the... <laughs> Okay. In the, yeah, I mean, it's tricky. Right. Any any other insights? Well, I had to definitely give a. I had to do a little more thinking to keep okay. straight what letter I was up to because yeah. who thinks of you don't really think of letters as being numbered. Of course. Right, but and even still, like you didn't even need to think about it, but that's how your brain went to it, right? It was like, oh, what's the 10th letter in the alphabet? Well, you just needed to look at the number, the, the letter before it. You knew what the next letter in the, in the alphabet was, right? But your brain suddenly, because you were incorporating numbers into it, started thinking about it differently, right? So the point of this exercise um, is obviously to show that um, multitasking introduces a number of different elements. The first is like, so anytime we, we start with something, right? You, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're focusing on a task, right? Especially difficult ones, right? So when you're focusing on, let's say what matters most, right? Call it lead generation. Maybe it's your family or your children, right? Um, and then suddenly you get a distraction. Your brain has to switch focus, reorient itself, to, to whatever you're being distracted by and then reorient itself again back to what you were doing before. That's why it took longer to complete both tasks, right? It was just two tasks, writing all the numbers and all in, in the alphabet, right? But when you did one in, and then the other, you were able to do it faster. You were able to do it without mistakes. You were able to do it with, with less thinking involved. And John was able to do it more neatly, right? How many other, would anybody else's handwriting suffer the second time around, right? So it's not just about time. And a lot of people feel like multitaskers, they just get things done so much faster. And what, what I hope this exercise just proved to you is that it's not necessarily about, is that, that, that that's just not true. It might feel like you're getting things done faster. And yet, if you were to just focus on a task, get it done, and then move on to the next task, task like we did the first time, you'd actually probably find that you're more efficient. You're going to find that you get, you make less mistakes. Um, And there, there, there have been studies that have been done about this, but multitasking is actually something that um, is, is more of a myth than anything else. And the, and the main reason it's a myth is because it became something that became desirable at one point and still is. And yet the reality is the people who are most successful are, are, are able to recognize and prioritize things, complete them, and then move on to the next priority. Those people might claim to be really good multitaskers. And what they really are is really good at prioritizing things and getting them done and getting multiple tasks done quickly because they're able to prioritize them and, and, and knock them out. They're not actually going back and forth. Does that make sense? How do we feel about that? Can I share with you something? Yeah. Um, I believe that multitasking came 
about 15 years ago or 20 years ago when we had to impress the employer that we were applying for a job mm -hmm. and putting it on the resume and it was like a must to have this word exactly. on the resume and and this is how we created it uh, pretty exactly. much yeah that's why i was saying multitasking is a figment of our imagination and it was created because that's because people thought it was like a good thing to be able to do except now that we've had some time right and some actual research has been done there was um a uh, a researcher out of stanford university who studied uh, a group of 262 students and he essentially gave them a, a, a questionnaire where they rated how good a multitasker they was. And then he took all of the people that were that were rated the highest as being the best multitaskers in the group. And he took the other group, the other half of the group that were the bad multitaskers, and he gave them each a series of tests, tasks to complete, right? That would test their ability to multitask. And here's what they found. The group that was that were high multitask performers tended to do terribly at all of the tests. They had more mistakes. They did, just didn't get some of them done, right? And they, and, and they would just, they would focus on just, uh, the, the, one of the quotes for it was, um, it turns out that high multitaskers are suckers for irrelevancy. Meaning they, they, they focus on things that are completely irrelevant and don't matter. Um, I, you know, so it's not that we can't do two things at once. So let me be clear about that, right? It's not that we can't do two things at once, right? I'm breathing right now, I'm standing up straight and I'm talking and teaching to all of you, right? So I can obviously, my brain has the capacity to do multiple things at the same time. Except if I was also sitting here on my phone sending a text message, how 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 much better like how, how good of a job do you think I would be doing teaching this class right now, right? Certain things, yes, we're able to do simultaneously, but anything of importance, if something's truly important, why would you put that? Why would you risk that, right? Why would you risk distraction, Dave? I think that the word focus, Dan, that you mentioned a couple of times is the, the most powerful. I mean, a lot of people multitask because they can't focus is the way I look at it. Sure. And I'll admit that that's me. I'll admit that. I think I am a capable multitasker and above average one, but, you know, trying to focus when you've got 10 things you want to get done throughout the day yep. and you kind of get 50 or 75% done. You're like, well, okay, I'm almost done, but let me kind of start this other one. It's not a compliment when I said that I'm a pretty good multitasker, I guess, if that makes sense. I wasn't complimenting myself. Right. Um, so, so what you need to put on your resume instead, Silva, is I am excellent at prioritizing and accomplishing tasks in a timely manner, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> um, that's really the, the skill that, 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 you should, that you should be promoting, right? All right. However, I will say this is that there's multitasking and there's the ability to grasp multi-concepts that are relevant. Some people can't do the latter. And sure. that is, I think, something that's- well, that, that, uh, That's definitely, uh, it's a different, it, it, we're it's very much a, a, a something completely different than what we're talking about, right? Um, that, that is more a matter of perspective, um, visual, like being able to visualize things, uh, spatial differential, right? Um, and spatial awareness. Um, being able, and, and that, that is, that is definitely a, a, a skill um, that not everybody has, right? So, or not everybody has to the same, to, to the same degrees, but not quite what, not quite what we're talking about. Um, all right. So we just talked about multitasking and how multitasking just doesn't really work. Another one that we have is that, is that willpower is something that we just, we, you either have it or you don't. And, and the fact of the matter is we all have willpower. The, the difference is that we all, but we all suffer. We all assume that we can just have willpower whenever we need it, right? And here's the truth of the matter is that willpower is like a battery. The more tired we get, the less willpower we'll have. Right? I know my danger zone 
is like after three o'clock. When it comes to my health and eating, after three o'clock, if I've had like a busy day, I have to be really careful about what I have around me <laughs> from a food standpoint. And I know, and I just, I, I just know that about myself. So I, I, I create strategies to, to not put myself in situations like that, right? Until I get home for dinner, right? Or else those, that, that extra snack that I pick up or whatever, can, you know, is, is, is a challenge. We all have those kind of things. Um, and so willpower is essentially the will to say yes to what you need to do and the power to say no to everything else. That is our ability to make good decisions. So I'm going to use a couple of, I'm going to use a couple of examples uh, to demonstrate this other than my own, right? So again, Stanford School of Business um, in California uh, teamed up with the University of Negev in Israel to, uh, to do a study on willpower and decision making. So what they did is they analyzed about uh, over 1,100 parole board hearings in Israel, um, which was about 40% of their total parole requests over that 10-month, um, uh, over a 10-month period. It was about 40% of all the pro parole hearings that they had. And the way Israel did their parole uh, hearings at the time was it was a panel of eight judges, um, or it was, a, it was eight, they were, they were assigned to eight different judges. Um, and they would essentially hear anywhere from 14, 15 parole requests to 35 requests a day. They would start in the morning. They would take a, a morning break. They would, they would go again, and then they would take a late lunch, and then they would come back and, and complete the day. All right. Um, what they found through this study was that parolees chances of being re released peaked at about 65%. They had a 65% chance of being released if they if their hearing was first thing in the morning or after right after one of the first breaks, one of one of the two breaks. And then towards the end of each session, right? So there were three sessions during the day the morning, right after the morning break, and then after lunch. If you were at the end of any of those sessions, you had almost a 0% chance of being released. And what the study shows is that as, as the judges would get tired, right, from having to make these decisions, which are pretty high impact decisions, right? Like these aren't like just easy decisions. This is deciding some, like whether or not somebody's going to stay in prison or if you're gonna release them back into society, right? So it's pretty high stakes. And so what they, what they realized is as they were getting tired, the judges would default to their default decision, right? They had less power to make good, like make, to, to think things through and make a, a good decision. So what they would do is they would just go to their default, which their default decision was no, keep the, keep the parolee in prison. Right now, why would that be their default decision? Right. In their mind, if I'm not sure if this person should be released into the general population again, I'm just going to keep them inside. Right. That's the safe choice in their mind. To the point where it was 0% chance of being released if you were one of the last people to get to, to be heard in a session. Crazy to think about, right? went from 65% chance of being released to 0% chance of being released just by when your hearing was having nothing having with no with no other factors so when when our willpower runs out um we we go to our default now what the 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 question becomes what are our defaults right our defaults tend to be safe choices comfortable choices Right, things that are going to make us feel better. Another study that was done um, again at Stanford University. Um, this was also from the one thing. 
um, studied uh, research undergraduate students. And he, and he took a, a group of students and he assigned half of them to, mem to memorize a seven digit number and the other half memorized a two digit number. And what they were done, what they did is they placed them in a room and had them memorize the number. They could take as long as they wanted to memorize the number. And whenever they were ready, they had to, they left the room and they had to walk down the hall and punch the number in at the, uh, in it, go to another room and then, and then write the number down. On the way from where they memorized the number to where they had to write it down, they were offered a snack. And they were given two choices, a bowl of fruit or a piece of chocolate cake. The group that was given the seven digit number to memorize was twice as likely to take the chocolate cake than the fruit compared to the other group. Right? Just that extra five numbers of thought, right? It's not like you're not talking about some huge, like, you know, task difference. Just the difference of memorizing two numbers versus seven made them twice as likely to take the, 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 the to, you know, to indulge themselves in the chocolate cake. So what's the lesson here? What do you think the lesson is? Stay away from things that will drain you because when a hard decision arises, you'll be less likely to make the right one. That's, that's a good one. What else? When do you think we have the most willpower? The ability to make good decisions. When our energy is the highest. Yeah, when our energy is the highest, right? So what if we were to schedule our days where we were, we were able to do our most important work either first thing in the morning or if we have really important work to do in the afternoon, we make sure to give ourselves a break so we have time to, to recover before having to do them, right? I've been working all day and every day this week before one o'clock, around 12.30, 12.45, I've, ta I've taken a little break. I've gone and gotten myself a drink. You know, I do some jumping jacks in my office to kind of like loosen myself up, maybe some stretching, right? Because I know I have to come on and teach at one, right? It helps, you know, so get your energy back up. A little bit right because we only have so much willpower it's like a battery that gets drained as we go through the day so can we schedule the most important things we need to do during the day either first thing in the morning when we have the most willpower or give ourselves break how many people tend to tend to uh have like you know tend to have a shorter fuse at night when they get home from work Just one. That's me too. I have to give myself a break before I like, you know, or else, you know, if I've had, a, if, especially if I've had a rough day, my patience is less, right? My ability to think or, 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 or talk or have deep conversation is less. Well, for me personally, if somebody asks me after like eight o'clock for a favor or something, my default answer is no. I yeah. think if it's right now or a week from then, the answer is no. Don't yeah. even ask. Yeah. Right? Because by that time, we're just done. And right? then I, I noticed one thing in my, my personal life as well. Like, I like working out a lot. Um, and... Because like I schedule like a lot of the real estate stuff and all the classes and stuff and the Zoom calls or all that stuff is in the morning. I started I've been working out um for the past couple of months like around like um around like seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night I'll go in and get in the gym and get a workout in, and I noticed like like my quality of workouts is like is a lot more inconsistent. You know I get a lot a lot less good workouts in throughout the week than yeah. when I'm you know in the morning. And I like also like intermittent fasting because it just helps keep my focus up and a lot of other health benefits. And like I normally fast in the morning. And so like I'm going to try and reschedule so like I can be in the gym while still listening to Zoom calls. And that way I get all my me stuff out the way in the morning. Yeah. 
if, 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 you know, if fasting and working out are important, try to get, get them done in the morning, right? That's the lesson of this, right? If something's important, try to get it done first. Let, let your brain not have to think so much about the unimportant, uh, the unimportant things, right? If things are less important, it's okay. Like it, it, it's okay for you to have more of a default response. Now, if you need to be productive all day and you need to be able to make good decisions all day, what do you need to do? Schedule breaks, right? Give yourself time to rest and recover. Sound good? So I have another question too. Sure. So back in my, uh, my school days, which is, isn't too far back, a lot of my, my best essays came at 11.59 p.m. right before midnight when it was due, which is like a lot of those essays, it's like, were well written because I had that that urgency and those were like later at night but like when it's in the morning even though I know those essays I do it's like although my willpower is high it's like some of the time I just didn't want to do them until later off in the day um well so what you're actually talking about isn't so much willpower as it is um like because because you're not quite talking about willpower like willpower is your ability to make good decisions mm right? What you're talking about is, oh, crap, if I don't get this done right now, I'm going to fail, right? I'm going to fail this assignment. Yeah. Right? So what you're talking about is urgency, mm. which, which is honestly, like we, we talked about this the other day, right? That tends to be when people perform, mm -hmm. right? We will say, we will, uh, we will take whatever amount of time is assigned to us to complete a task. So that's not so much willpower as it is, as it, as, as it is needing to get something done by a deadline and, and getting it done at the deadline. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if, if, you know, Tama also said like eight o'clock at night is her shining star time. And my, my question to her is, well, why is that? Is it because she has less distractions in her world? So she doesn't need as much will, willpower to get things done. I don't know about all of you, but at eight o'clock at night, I don't have agents calling me with questions. I don't have staff knocking on my door. Right. So that, so I'm not saying that you don't, you have less willpower, but my, what, what you might, you might not have as much willpower, but you also might not need as much willpower at that point. If there's, if there's urgent things that need to get done by a certain date or a certain time because the urgency will always create the effect of getting things done but that but urgency does not denote priority either right it just tends to be what we prioritize because it's urgent as opposed to necessarily being most important Does that make sense? And, and, and Tama, I'm not, I'm not saying that like, there are definitely people that are night people, not morning people, right? My sit, my, I have an older sister. She's a, a doctorate. She's a professor at a university. She's a incredible flautist. She was like the number one flautist in Connecticut in high school. Right. Right. Like highly, highly, uh, you know, productive person. And she's a night person. Right. She has a truck. She had trouble getting up early in the morning. And yet. The, yeah, there are there are things that I know she would like to get done in her world that she doesn't get done. And, and she has create and she's able to be more creative at night and things like that, which helps, which helps her. All right. So so night people and morning people, def, that that definitely exists. But I would say from a matter of willpower, it also it, it's also really going to be dependent on what like on, on 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 a lot of other things. <laughs> nice, Tama. <laughs> um, all right, let's keep going. So we're about halfway through today, um, which is actually per we're right on track, which is awesome. We're not too far behind, which I like. Um, and so we're going to take kind of what we've what we've talked about so over the past couple of days, and we're going to try to put them in, put a lot of this stuff into practice. All right. 
um, we've talked a lot about purpose and um, we're going to, we're going to dive into that a little bit. And then we're going to give you a couple tools that you can use to, um, to help, to help put this into, into practice. All right. Um, one of the things that uh, I've been told here at Keller Williams that I thought was the most brilliant thing in the world is that you're never more than five years away from being anything you want or having anything you want or being anywhere you want in life. It's just a matter of finding purpose prioritizing and then you get the results R remember the science of success like the productivity are the results right that's what we see but what we're not seeing is everything that that goes into that production which is the purpose behind your actions and your ability to prioritize what matters most Yep. That's why we use the iceberg as a, as, as the metaphor here, right, John is because production is what we see on the surface. What we see are people's results. What we're not seeing is all the work they're doing behind the scenes. What we're not seeing is the, is the, is the purpose that drives them. Um, so purpose is the force that guides you, right? that allows you to make priorities in your life. The purpose and the priorities then determine your actions and the actions then produce the results, right? But how productive you are is not who you are. It's all those other things that are more important. So I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between a goal and a mission. So a mission is your life's purpose, right? A mission is never ending. Goals are things you set along the way to achieving your life purpose. It's a specific desired result that you're looking to get. And they can be completed. So you might have a five-year, a one-year, a one-month goal, right? Something that you're trying to, a goal that you're looking to accomplish today or this week, which is, you know, almost here, right? So I want to do a little exercise with you um, to help you maybe uncover some purpose. We're not going to, and, and, and nothing, I'm, nothing we're going to do in this, in this, in these one hour sessions is going to be the answer. What I'm hoping to give you are some tools that you can use to kind of dive into this a little bit more. All right. So I'm going to give you, we're going to do another, um, we're going to do another exercise here to help maybe to help give you some guidance on, on, on creating a, 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 a personal life mission or a mission statement just per se, right? So first step is to identify what you feel connected to, right? What are some of the topics that you're drawn to? Videos that you like to watch, podcasts that you like to listen to, books that you like to read, shows that you like to watch, whatever. What kind of topics or, or ideas are you drawn to? What causes are you most passionate about? What impact do you want to see uh, for your life, right? How do you envision yourself impacting the people around you or the world? What are the kind of things that motivate you to get into action? Write down a few of them. Write down anything that comes to mind. All right. Now what I want you to do is I want you to write down some things that you're really good at. What are some of the skills or the gifts that you have that um, or that people say you have? Right. What gives you energy? Things that you enjoy doing. What are some of the things that like you'll you'll start doing the, you'll start doing them and suddenly you're like wait how is it already six o'clock? Oh crap! I forgot to feed the kids. What 
What are those, some of those unique gifts that you have? If you felt like you were put on this earth to do one thing, what is it? Now, I want you to think about these things, and this is where we're going to tweak, and I'm just going to give you a third step here, which will just kind of help you kind of start creating, uh, uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a simple, it's a simple uh, way of creating just a personal mission statement, right, to think about it, and this, is, this will be a good backbone for you to kind of start thinking about this, right, you just write down, the mission for my life is to, and then pick something that you have a passion for, pick something that's important to you. And then add an action word, like by implementing or through or with one of your unique skills. So one, I'll give you an example. One of my unique skills is that I'm, I'm, I'm very good at speaking, right? Even since I was a kid, like if I had to do a presentation in class, I was always really comfortable with it. I'm comfortable in front of people, right? It's something, it's just a natural skill that I have. One of the things I love is I, I like say turning, I like to call it turning on lights. I love talking to people and, and, and seeing a light bulb go off in their head. Like helping them find an answer or helping them find uh, an idea that excites them. All right. So a simple example would be the mission for my life is to help people find the answers to, to, to live a better life through teaching and speaking. Whatever. That's just a simple example. Right. But you can take these things. And yes, uh, what Marion said, right. Prioritize your passions. It's all about priority. What is the, what is out of everything you wrote down? What is something that really going to excite you and get you going? What's something that's going to give you some purpose that's going to excite you in the morning. And then if you can try to accomplish that by doing something that you're good at, You'll wake up every morning with a ton of energy and a ton of purpose. And then it's just a matter of now taking the next steps, which is figuring out what are the goals that are going to allow me to live that life at a higher level that are going to help me achieve that purpose. And that's what we're going to talk about now, which is goal setting. So We're going to talk today about uh, goal setting to the now. We're going to finish up in this in this section. I love it, Tama. Who else has a goal? Has a mission that they want to put them in the chat. Who else has an example? Put them in the chat. All right, and we're gonna and we're gonna now finish up the, today's session by talking about how to set goals to help you achieve that journey. And the first, and we call this goal setting to the now because you just you just threw out a big, big purpose, right? A large purpose. It's something that you're gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say like whatever you wrote down has to be like the purpose that you're gonna drive for your entire life, right? You don't have to marry it, but you can date it for a while, see how it feels. See how much energy you get from it. I love that, John. That's great. All right. But in order to do that, it's important to set some goals along the way. So we're going to talk about um, the focusing question. We're going to talk about time blocking. We're going to talk, talk about creating accountability. All right. So we have some tools that we use at, at Keller Williams um, to help people um, 
set goals and develop a plan. The first tool is called a GPS. What that does is allows us to put kind of a, it's kind of like a one page business plan for achieving a goal. And then that allows you to prioritize your actions using a, the focusing question so that you can then set the time aside for actually getting what, doing what matters most. And then create a system to ensure that you actually stay on track through accountability. All right. So when we talk about a GPS, what we're actually talking about is creating a goal, right? That's the G. Typically, this is going to be an annual goal for a GPS, right? And the way you time block and, and the way you uh, set goal set to the now is you take your purpose, right? And you say, okay, what would I need to accomplish in the next five years so that someday I accomplish that goal, right? So I'm going to use Elon Musk as an example. His goal is to colonize Mars, right? Well, what's one step that he would need to accomplish in order to make that possible, right? Well, he needs to be able to get to Mars. Then he's got to be able to get people to Mars, right? In order to get people to Mars, he's going to have, he's got to build rockets that can get into outer space. Right? In order to save the world, he's got to reduce, you know, the he's, he's got to reduce the human population's uh, need for um, to burn carbon uh, carbon emissions. Right? He's got to reduce our carbon output. Okay. Well, what's something you can do to do that? Well, you can get people to use more less less uh, less fossil fuels. Well, how can you do that? Right? So he set. So you're able to set these other. You can see all of a sudden how some of the things that he's done with his life. Right? Like starting um, Solar City and starting an electric car company, and building a space company, right? They all are priorities. They're all steps in order to get, get him there. And that's the second step is identifying our priorities. What are the three or four things that we can focus on, right? That are gonna get us to our goal, right? These are the 20% items that we talked about. And then the last piece, the S, is a, our strategies. What are the maybe three to six strategies that we, that we can use to accomplish our priorities? Now, here's the thing. If you have any more than four priorities, your goal is probably not specific enough. If you need more than four priorities to accomplish it, your goal is not, is, is not specific enough. If you need more than six strategies, your priority is also probably not specific enough. If you need fewer than maybe three strategies, your priority probably isn't a priority and it's probably a strategy in and of itself, right? So you could have a priority in your business. You, you could have a goal of selling 50 houses, let's say, right? And your priority number one might be to, uh, to take 30 listings. That would be priority one. And priority two might be to find 40 buyers. Now your strategy around finding listings, strategy one might be, uh, you know, a, a expired, a expired listings strategy, right? Strategy two might be geographic farming. Strategy three might be uh, advertising and marketing, right? You see how that, you see how that works? What this allows you to do is essentially create a one page business plan. And that business plan will look something like this. You're going to have your goal on top. You're going to list your three priorities. And you're going to list them in priority. Meaning whichever one is most important is going to be priority number one. 
And then you're going to list your, you know, three to five strategies. Again, in order of importance. That are going to allow you to accomplish that priority, which will allow you to then accomplish, accomplish that goal. And how you're going to, and, and then now how do you create focus around these strategies and these priorities is by asking the focusing question, which is the second tool. What's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or necessary, right? We spent a lot of time on this yesterday, right, Dave? When we took our, 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 our to-do list, right? Where we listed all of the things we could do and we narrowed it down to all of the things that we should do, right? Like the four or five things we should do. We were essentially asking that one question. What's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? So we ask the one, we, we, we create the one year goal. And then we ask the focusing question back and we, and we, and we bring it back in time. So based on my one year goal, what's the one thing I can do in the next six months that will put me on track and all but guarantee I'm going to hit my one year goal? Based on my six month goal, what is the one thing I can do this month to put me on track to hit my six month goal such that if I hit that, it'll, it'll make my one year goal all but, all but uh, complete? Based on my monthly goal, what is the one thing I can do this week? to put me on track to hitting my monthly goal. And based on my weekly goal, what is the one thing I can do today to put me on track to hit my weekly goal, which will put me on track, right? You see how we're bringing it all, we're bringing it back to the now. That's why we call it goal setting to the now. One of the biggest problems that people have with goals is that they set them when. When do we tend to set goals? Um, at the end of the year? Yeah, at the end of the year or the very beginning of the year, right? Right around New Year's. When, when's the next time we think about them? The next year? The following year, right? By operating this way, it, it, brings, th it brings that big goal down to scale, right? It allows us to think really, really big but then to go really, really small. And it gives us something specific that we can focus on. So this is something, so we just went through a couple of weeks ago, a business planning clinic, right? How many people were on the business planning clinic? Do we have some, so we have, so we have some people on this call that have some goals for next year. Having the goals is only the first step. The second step is now going through this process. Anybody willing to share one of their goals? I'll share. Sure, John. For 2022 is to have 60,000 in GCI. All right. So here's what I would ask you, John. I lied. Net, net, not GCI. Net. Net. Okay. Net GCI after, after capping, right? Yeah. All right. So then, John, the, the question I would ask you, what are the three things, the three to four things that you need to focus on that are going to allow you to, ha to accomplish that? Um, the three things that me and uh, Jen kind of picked out is open houses, um, social media, and uh, seminars. All right, beautiful. So what are, the stra what, are the, what are the three to five strategies you're going to use to, uh, to, um, to do seminars? Um, for seminars, it's first having getting the um, like the handouts and stuff like that for the seminars. Second is attending some seminars at first from other people to get some ideas of how I want to host my own seminars. The third is finding potential other lenders or attorneys and you know other people that are part of the process to then come and partner on my um, on my seminars so it's not just me speaking the whole time, and then. From there, it's hosting one to two, uh, two, I think we said two, two seminars a month, every month. 
um, and kind of just doing that consistently. All right. So, John, by what point in this year do you want to be do you want to be hosting two seminars per month? Um, by what point this year? I say maybe it could be possible by next month. Okay. So, so you're saying by Jan? I'm gonna I'm gonna. All right, so this is a 22, 22 goal, let's say, right? So January, by January. I so let's be. say in January, in every month mm. thereafter, you want to be hosting two seminars every month, right? Correct. Okay, perfect. So what is the, what are, so you, you have three, you gave me three steps that you need to, that you feel like you need to complete in order to get to that point, right? Mm. First was you needed to research mm. what seminars people are doing, how they're doing them, get some ideas from people who are already doing it, right? Correct. The second is that you need to find uh, you need to find some partners to help mm -hmm. you do it, to help put them on mortgage people, attorneys, inspectors, whoever. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the third is you have to actually create the seminars and the collateral materials and the flyers and all that stuff. Right. Correct. All right. So based on those three strategies, what is the what what is the one thing that you need to come like? So you have four things that you need to come. You have three things that you need to complete. Mm -hmm. before january 1st in order for you to host your first seminar right yeah if you could only do one of them which would be the most important i say probably um researching and getting the handouts um like for the, the materials for the seminars because i could always just okay. do it on my own and then bring people on as i go on all right so here's the question if you were to do some research but you mm -hmm. did not produce the collateral materials or get partners. Would you be okay hosting your, your first seminar? Yeah, I say so. Okay. So then really you don't need to do all three. What you really need to do is the first one, right? Is research. Okay. So what's the one thing you can do to research prop to, to research these seminars? Start going to other people's seminars, seeing how they do it. Okay. And what's the one thing you need to do in order to do that? Um, Google search? I don't, I don't know. Okay. Google. So, so find people who are doing seminars, you mean? Yeah. Okay. So what's one thing you can do today to do that? Well, after this call, I start looking up to see who in my exactly, circle. Is. Right. So that's yeah. how. So thank you for thank you for volunteering, John, because this is the exact process that people don't go through. Yeah. Don't typically go through. They set the goal, which is 60, 60, you know, GCI net. And they say, OK, I'm going to do social media. I'm going to do seminars. I'm going to do open houses. And that's where most people end. Right. John at least did the additional st step, took the next step, which was he started thinking about these things, right? And what he needed to get done. But what he didn't, but, but what, what's most necessary, what's most crucial to actually getting it done is figuring out, okay, it is, is prioritizing, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, if, if John gets to, to January and he hasn't found partners and he doesn't have any kind of fancy presentations or collateral, but he's done the research and he knows like he knows what he needs to do. Could he host a seminar? Yes. Is it better for him to host a seminar in January and start doing them twice a month? Is it better for him to do that? Will he get, is he more likely to get the results he's looking for by doing that? Or is he more likely to get the results by then focusing on his second priority, which was building out the collateral materials and not doing the seminar, right? You see how, you see how all of a sudden results become easier when you create priority. So yeah, John, in a perfect world, you would do you would have you would take the time to do all the research you would go out there and you'd get mortgage partners or people that are going to you know bring food for it or sponsor them or speak at them right you'd have really nice looking collateral material but what's more what's the most important thing that you actually do the seminars right mm -hmm. 
that's that's what's actually going to get you to the goal. That's the priority. So by focus, by asking the focusing question, what is the one thing that I can do? We're able to we're able to focus on the results that we're looking to get. Make sense? How do you all feel about that? I feel extremely inspired right now. All right. So that is uh, so that is kind of the goal for today. <laughs> because extraordinary results become possible when where you want to go is completely aligned with what you do today. And the problem is, and, and, and the problem most people have, including myself, like I'm not, I'm I'm the biggest culprit of this too, right? Is that we lose sight of our bigger goals in the day to day. We focus on what's in front of us. We focus on other people's priorities. That has been that has been one of my my big ones this week. Right? I've spent a lot of time this week focused on things that other people need my help with that don't necessarily move me closer to my goals. All right? All right. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be right back in here at one o'clock. We're going to be taking some of this, uh, taking everything we've talked about, and we're going to be having a conversation around money, right? Because remember, the goal, the, the path, right, your mind map is to get is to get clarity around who you are so that you can go out there and do work that's going to inspire you and create productivity for you, right? So that you can then bring other people into your world to continue, you know, to expand that mission. And then eventually you get to the point where you have money that you can do that with as well. So we're going to talk a little, we're going to talk about finance, uh, financials tomorrow um, and uh, some of the rules of money, the path of money, things like that and building wealth. All right. How are we feeling today? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty similar to you, Dan, when we're aware, like I like helping other people envision and work their thought process out to like brainstorm what they could do or what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And like, sometimes I forget to do that within myself. Of course. I said it in our first session, right? Half the reason I teach this class is to remind me of all the principles to remind myself is to create clarity for myself around what's most important. Right. Love it. Thanks, John. Any other ahas from today? All right. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you back in the zoom room tomorrow morning for our high five Friday and um, in our bold law discussion. And then I will see you back in here at one o'clock for our final session of Quantum Leap. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful day.